I'll start by taking the time to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, many of you are joining us today from uh, different places, near and far, and acknowledge that the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Uh, note that this event is being recorded for public use and it's gonna be posted on the website of the college and you'll receive a link, a link uh, to that uh, archive after it's been posted. So we're gonna start with a uh, 15 minute business meeting. I think there's a new slide. In November, I reported that the college uh, council and leaders of the clusters and committees had a strategic planning retreat back in September. And this was to establish the work of the college uh, for the next three years uh, with a view that uh, currently or up until now, uh, each new principal that has a one year term comes in and sets an agenda. And then that goes for a year and then there's a change of plans. Um, so uh, we thought it would allow us to establish um, a, of a three uh, plan. And we agree on four strategic priorities um, uh, to guide our work. And I'm gonna to report to some of the current activities that are related to these. First, in terms of enriching retirement for college members, um, good planning um, starts uh, as you uh, start to think about uh, planning for retirement. And uh, so we're really pleased to see that uh, retirement workshops are now being organized again by faculty relations and HR uh, and involving uh, college members. Uh, the last workshop was held in November for 75 faculty and very well received. And the plan is uh, to continue to hold these workshops twice a year, spring and fall. And at those workshops, we introduce them to um, people who have different aspects of how they're approaching retirement and um, uh, talk to them about the college and the various activities uh, that, that are offered. So enriching uh, retirement is the aim of our speaker programs and special interest groups. And these represent a sizable proportion of the 75 events that are undertaken at the college each year. So you've received a survey asking your input into the speaker programs, and it would be great to hear from you if you haven't had the chance uh, to uh, fill this out yet. It's not onerous, it's a reasonably short survey. Sandra Bressler, who has been organizing the speakers for these meetings, has volunteered to take over from Carolyn Gilbert for overall coordination of all of the events as program cluster leader. I thank both Carolyn and Sandra for their considerable contributions. Secondly, we want to increase the community profile and the involvement of the college and its members in the community. The volunteering special interest group uh, led by Nancy Galini um, had its one year uh, celebration uh, last month. And we've been hearing from Emeriti about their experiences as volunteers and from organizations seeking volunteers. There is interest in the college becoming a broker to make it easier to connect people interested in volunteering uh, with volunteering opportunities and organizations who are uh, interested in um, people joining their uh, work. In terms of enhancing uh, recognition of Emeriti and the Emeritus College uh, to the university, the college executive, Just Bloom, uh, Paul Harrison and I, recently had a really terrific meeting with the new provost, uh, Gage Averill. Uh, Gage recognizes that Emeriti are not regularly engaged in, uh, as he calls it, the lifeblood of the university, and he is committed to working on this. Arrangements are being made for a uh, wee executive to meet with the deans, and then the department heads and directors to talk to them about the college. And we're making progress in having Emeriti better recognized as citizens of UBC. It's small steps, but when you go to sign up for something at UBC, we want to have Emeriti listed as a category of affiliation. Most recently, we've done this for research and innovation events and for the Faculty of Education annual nine-week walking program. 
if you go to sign up for something and only see the usual faculty, staff, student, alumni categories, let us know. We've had a very quick response and a very quick and positive response whenever we've contacted groups uh, about this. And finally, uh, central to uh, these priorities, we have to ensure that the college is sustainable. And here it's your contribution as a volunteer. And I noticed that there's all sorts of people who are already uh, embedded in the work of the college uh, on, the, on the call. Um, but we uh, uh, welcome uh, new people uh, to step up and uh, join the, the leadership. Um, the uh, College Nominations Committee is just beginning its annual search for new volunteers um, to join the council and uh, college committees. And you would be most welcome uh, to discuss being involved with those listed uh, on the uh, people section of the website or with myself or Joost Blom, who's chairing the nominations committee. We're in the need of a newsletter editor, as you've heard before. Carolyn Gilbert has most generously volunteered to resume this role, but she held this back in the Association for Professors of Maritime. Uh, and so uh, this is um, wonderfully amazing of Carolyn to uh, do this, uh, but she's she's done a lot of work for the college and um, we need to find somebody else to uh, come in and, and work with her on the editorial board and resume the role as an editor. So I'm now going to hand uh, this meeting over to uh, Bill McCutcheon to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Anne. Well, today we are absolutely delighted to have Yves Tiberdian, who's uh, from UBC, professor in the Department of Political Science. Um, he's uh, got his PhD at Stanford University in 2002, and he was a uh, Harvard Academy Scholar in 2006. And he also was a Fulbright Scholar before that in 1996. And he's Kan Wakai Chair in Japanese Research and Director of the Center for Japanese Research at the University. In November 2017, he was made Chevalier de l'Ordre National de Mérite by the French President. He is a Distinguished Fellow at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada and a Senior Fellow at the University of Alberta's China Institute. He is an International Steering Committee at Pacific Trade and Development Conference and a visiting professor at Tokyo University, the Taipei School of Economics and Sciences Po Paris. He has held other visiting positions at National uh, Shang-Chi University in Taiwan, GRIPS in Tokyo, and the Jakarta School of Public Policy in Indonesia. His research focuses on the comparative political economy of East Asia and on global economic and environmental governance. His latest book is The East Asia COVID-19 Paradox, published in August 2021 by the University Press. He has several previous publications and is currently Jeez. working on two new books. Oh, man. Dr. Kiebergian co-founded the Vision 20 initiative in 2015, a new coalition of global scholars and policymakers aimed at providing a long-term perspective on the challenges of global economic and environmental governance. So he is going to speak today on facing Xi Jinping's comparative approaches from the US, European Union, Canada, Japan, India, Southeast Asia, Singapore. So welcome Yves and thank you for speaking to us. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Eves, and welcome. Hello, William. Very good to see you. And I see lots of colleagues here. Hello, uh, Phil, Diana. Uh, I see, oh, Paul is here. And Don. Yeah, wonderful. Olaf, Judy. Hey, Judy. <laughs> I'm not on the island today. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, and I see more pages. Yeah. So it's we gave you a big long introduction, Eve. Did you did you hear it? Uh, no, I just arrived, but this is good. Thank you for doing this. Mm -hmm. So is it ready to go or mm -hmm. ready to go? 
Okay. Is it good to do PowerPoint? Is it what's usually done? Yeah. Um, okay. Right. If you pictures. have some things to to uh, highlight right. and to, for the audience to read, yes, please. Okay. So, hello, everyone. It's a great honor being with you. Uh, you know, it's like a, an enormous concentration of knowledge here. It's very uh, humbling, actually. So, I look forward to the conversation with each of you. Many of you, like Diana, know a lot more about China than me. Uh, so, I look forward to to your comments and your thoughts. And, and knowing this, I actually prepared uh, a contextual talk. So I'm going to now share. Mm -hmm. All right. I will also preface uh, what I'm saying here with uh, a humble note that we are in a period of very fast change and interactive change and change at multiple levels and um and there's a lot that we don't know <laughs> so uh it's a period where really you know it's hard to do clear statements about anything uh but i'll try to do more of a framework that that opens up some interpretation recognizing that uh, you know especially when it comes to what is xi jinping doing and thinking it's very hard to know right now <laughs> um so this is the long title that uh, William uh, and I uh, came up with. Um, and so the question is, are we facing the unraveling of the global order on the Xi or Xi and Putin or Xi and the US or who is doing it and is it happening? Um, and of course, we also know we just went through some extraordinary event around zero COVID and the abrupt ending of it with you know, my estimation, uh, probably 1.7 to 2 million Chinese uh, have been dying. It's almost happened already, but be before the end of March. And as with comparative data and the best estimates, they won't recognize it, right? Because they don't count it. But that's uh, by any uh, counting, having done a comparative research on COVID, this is what's happening. So I'm going to first step back and present the context uh, and the age of global disruptions and how China fits in that picture. Because we cannot understand uh, China's action and our behavior and thoughts about China without putting them in the bigger picture. Then I'll give three potential lenses to make sense of that disrupted world, including one that's China-centered. And then, uh, then finally turn to some Chinese behavior. Um, so... Uh, the first thing that I want to say up front is we are in a very unusual time or in a historic time. We're back in history in many ways. Uh, it's a time of interregnum or a time of power transition and a time of also of industrial revolution uh, and a lot of uncertainty. And we already are not in a stable rules-based order anymore. It's already the fact. We still, Canadians still hope that we are, and we affirm that we are, but it's it's already done uh, because the rules-based order was centered on unipolarity, on the unipolar American order uh, that sustained global liberalism. However, both of those things are uh, in transition, right? The US is not a unipolar power anymore, and they don't follow global liberalism anymore. Um, so the, this past fall, we just faced a great interaction of systemic shocks, probably the biggest in our lifetimes. And there is no real pilot in the plane. The closest thing we have, um, you know, is a G20, uh, and it's still very fractured and deadlocked. We rely on international institutions, international norm and practices, but currently geopolitics are overwhelming those institutions. The three systemic players, or the, the three systemic military players, China, Russia, and the US, all three have lost face in the current global institutions and essentially have withheld their support, whatever the rhetoric may be. Uh, for example, the, the US has killed the WTO uh, you know, judicial mechanism and is absolutely not investing in any uh, aspect of WTO today. So we have a moribund WTO, and that's not caused by Russia or China. Uh, however, of course, meanwhile, Russia has killed the norm of sovereignty in Europe. So they're each doing damage. Um, but since we live in a Westphalian world, no global governance can survive without the support of major states. 
Um, so this is a bit the environment where we are. And it's, of course, our mind has time delays and uh, we're used to, uh, you know, living today the way we lived yesterday. And so we have a hard time adjusting to this new reality. Um, and the problem of interacting disruptions is they create chaotic uncertainty. Uh, Stephen Pollitt, the uh, former central bank governor, was in a panel with me on systemic risk uh, back in June. And he said the problem is analyzing multiple forces compounds the uncertainty problem profoundly. When multiple long-term forces are acting together on the economy or system through time and interacting with one another, the economy and indeed the a global system uh, uh, themselves can behave erratically and appear unstable. Uh, and our usual prediction tools stop working. So I wanted to say those things first and then get to the three major ongoing long-term shifts that are happening and they frame everything around China. The first thing is we are living through the crisis of the globalization utopia. Uh, globalization, you know, the one we experienced recently is similar to the first globalization in the late 19th century, early 20th century. It's, it's an effort to have global economic integration, global markets, even though we don't have global governments, right? So we try to have the global markets then managed because everything in the economy has to be managed by individual states in a Westphalian system. There's always a mismatch here. And so the mismatch can only be bridged if there is minimum cooperation among the major states or if there is complete domination by one state. Uh, when you have domination like the US had, you can create global rules and global institutions. If that uh, transitions to a more multipolar situation, then you must have cooperation among the major states. Uh, today, we have a loss of political consensus around the states, but also within states. Within the US or within Europe, there is no more consensus in support of globalization. Uh, there's great polarization, great inequality. And in many countries, actually, even the major countries, uh, there's no more support for globalization. Uh, it's a minority support. So that's the first problem. The second is we're living through the two biggest industrial revolutions in a long time, uh, the digital AI revolution, including social media, which has remade all domestic politics and the green tech competition around climate. Uh, the green tech one is one I'm working on now. It's less recognized usually, but uh, essentially by the late 2030s, the global economy will be a green economy. There is no way around it. And countries that are slow to realize this will fall behind and uh, they will lose jobs, they will get poor. You know, it's the, it's the quintessential uh, aspect of a disruption. If you fall behind the disruption, you're gonna get poor and isolated. Uh, so it's the same as the digital revolution in that sense. But what's different this time, the first industrial revolution with coal was led by the British empire. The second one with oil and the third one with IT were led by the US hegemony. So they were under a, a dominant power. This time it's happening in a divided world with competition around uh, US and China uh, and others. So it's a, it's a divided uh, industrial revolution. And then third, we just went through the greatest power shift in 150 years with 22% of global GDP changing hands in 15 years between 2000 and 2015, which has led to the rise of the global South and a move from a Western dominated world to a multi-voices world, but essentially a non-Western dominated world anymore. And that creates all kind of cognitive dissonance because in the West, there's no understanding of that. There's still affirmation that the Western order is the way to go. And in the South, and of course China, but not just China, India, Southeast Asia, Eastern Africa, all kinds of places in the world. If you talk to G Gen Z in those countries, they all have the same spirit that, you know, the colonial times are over. Now it's time for their cultures to come back and to affirm their, their needs and their culture and their vision of the world. And all of them, they like a rules-based order, but they want to have a major say in it. So they don't accept a Western rules-based order. They want a negotiated, reformed rules-based order with all their voices in there. Um, and so the problem here is, then the West has to decide, do we accept this process or not, right? And the US response is no. Uh, Canada, Japan, EU would prefer yes. So there's a, a gap here between US and the rest of the West. 
but when you have that many changes happening at the same time, you have an additional issue of cognitive misunderstandings and cognitive interactions in the face of that change. I'll say more in a minute after that, and I know uh, Judy will have much to say there. Um, so the puzzle is how do we make sense of this and how do we address to all those things? Um, in the short term, we have additional short term shocks. So we have the war in Ukraine, we have US democratic governance crisis, we have Chinese governance crisis and a fork in the road. Um, we have the acceleration of climate disasters. We have great volatility and shocks in the global economy. We have multiple social debt democratic crisis in, in the global south. And we have global governance tools teetering on the brink of failure. So all those things are happening at the same time. China is in the middle of this, but it's I, I believe more and more that we can't make sense of both Western views on China and Chinese behavior and the consequences of both things without putting them in a larger context. Um, so Russia, uh, obviously, there's still no end in sight. We're going to have a very dangerous year, and I've given separate talks on, on that, on the war. Uh, we know Ukraine is getting lots of arms, and it's going to have uh, a good fighting shot in the months ahead. Russia is mobilizing, and etc. But the danger point will be if uh, Russia loses and Ukraine is able to uh, threaten Crimea, uh, and from what we understand of Putin is if he has a choice between losing the four provinces and Crimea and using nuclear weapons, he's more likely to use nuclear weapons. So that's where we'll have a major problem. So that is still with us, right? That major, major problem. Uh, but in turn, it's a very, very uh, horrible war uh, on the human side. It's shocking. And it has had huge ripple effects on the global economy, on Europe. And above all, there has been a unification of the West in response to Russia. The whole G7 plus Australia and Korea came together on sanctions. But to their surprise, the rest of the G20 did not follow. The G20 split 10 versus 10. None of the global South countries has followed the West. Uh, and so in the long term, this is not a viable situation. In the short term, this means that the IMF just predicted that Russia will have positive growth in 2023, which is a shock to all of us because we thought the sanctions would destroy Russia. The problem is, especially India, India uh, is now the first buyer of oil and energy from Russia, and second is China. Uh, but India and China are keeping Russia viable. And India is, you know, is technically a democracy and an ally of the West, but is refusing to join the West in those sanctions. Uh, so they, you know, it's a complex world, partly. By the way, when I talk to people from Africa or from uh, Southeast Asia or from India, I hear the same thing. It's like you realize you're keeping Putin, uh, you know, in his war, uh, you know, um, in business, right? Essentially, why are you doing this? You're supporting Putin. The response is no, we don't. We don't like what Russia is doing. But the West is hypocritical. They invaded Iraq. They invaded Libya. They colonized the world. They have no say on you know, human rights and democracy because they have done all the bad things. Uh, and so we don't believe anybody. And so we're keep keeping neutrality. And we want to see a reform of the world governance first, right? Before we throw our lot with someone. So there is that kind of attitude in general. Um, Second problem with us is U.S. democratic governance. We, I, I was reassured, I guess most of us were reassured by the midterms, which ended up better than expected uh, in many ways. We can talk more later, but we still have a very, very threatening 2024 in front of us. Uh, and it's still, you know, very serious people writing about the potential uh, risk of violence and civil war. And it's a survey among Republicans showing that 30% of Republican uh, agree with the statement that true American patriots have to resort to violence to save the country. Um, and there is no political support now, not even like 40%, it's le less than that, for investment in the global liberal order or the rules-based order. There is no support in the U.S. democratic system for that. There is only support for competition with China. Uh, so that's we have a major issue there in terms of thinking of a negotiated global order. Um, China is another major problem, and now we get to that. Um, 
we have seen over the last three years uh, essentially a turn toward more and more propaganda, more and more authoritarian rule. Uh, and then essentially the, the party Congress appointed sycophants and essentially second and third tier people in the standing committee that have only one thing is they complete completely, uh, you know, uh, um, well, uh, subservient to Xi Jinping. Uh, and so we have a very different kind of China from what we have had since Deng Xiaoping. Um, and Xi Jinping has shown the readiness to even throw the economy under the bus or to show the good governance practices that Xi, Deng Xiaoping tried to, interview, to uh, introduce in the name of political control and, and getting uh, you know, everything into his hands. And he has gone a propaganda way in many ways. Um, and so for anyone who studied policymaking like I did in the environmental field or economic fields, you know, we tended to think, well, okay, there is the propaganda side, there is the, you know, legal side, and then there is the pragmatism that we get from uh, the other hand, inherited from Deng Xiaoping. And in 2022, that pragmatism in policymaking uh, was overwhelmed by the search for complete power uh, by Xi Jinping. Uh, and so suddenly, everyone woke up. First of all, the middle class became mad for the first time. Uh, in 2022 around this, you know, because of the zero COVID practice. And then second, the world started to worry that China has turned, you know, very combative, very, uh, you know, internally focused and very authoritarian uh, and was swinging back away from international connectivity. Um, and we still don't know. I mean, the last two months have shown a lot of signals going back to a pragmatism along with the abandonment, abandonment of zero COVID. Uh, but at the same time, we don't know. It's really, um, there's a lot of uncertain signals going on at the moment. Um, and then the combination of US politics and Chinese politics has led to the US-China escalation, which is really an interactive process because both are fixated on each other. Um, and uh, a very interesting uh, piece here, I just put that quote from uh, Jennifer Chen Weiss, who is uh, Weiss at uh, Cornell, but she wrote this piece in Foreign Affairs after spending a year in the State Department at the top level, advising uh, being in the strategic unit. And she wrote, you know, from the inside, the climate of insecurity and fear in American politics is having pernicious effects on democracy and the quality of public debate about China. The desire to avoid appearing soft on China permeates private and public policy discussions. The result is an echo chamber that encourages analysts, bureaucrats, and officials to be politically rather than analytically correct. When individuals feel the need to out hawk one another to protect themselves and advance professionally, the result is groupthink. A policy environment that incentivizes self-censorship and reflexive positioning forecloses pluralistic debate and a vibrant marketplace for ideas, ingredients that are critical to the U.S. national competitiveness. So this is uh, something I thought very, um, very interesting and important. Uh, other things happening, we do have an acceleration of climate disasters that were very, very visible in 2022. Case in, case in point was Pakistan. What happened in Pakistan went beyond anything seen until now anywhere on the planet. A third of the country became underwater with a rate of inundation that was so much faster than anything seen before. And this is just uh, an indicator, right? You know, what will happen in 2024, 2025, 2030 will be a lot worse. So that's a huge reality. And when I do opinion polls of my students, by the way, at UBC, but also in Europe, in Japan, uh, in Asia, uh, pretty much everywhere I go, uh, they never put China as the number one problem. They put climate change. And then they put nationalism um, and uh, polarization as number two. Uh, so there's interesting uh, diffraction here, um, separation. So it was also the case in the US, in Europe, extreme heat wave in Europe last summer. Uh, we have an economy that's beset by multiple shocks, energy, uh, inflation, post-COVID, many, many things going on. Uh, and then we have about 50 countries that are on the brink of bankruptcy because of a combination of food, energy, climate, and economic shocks. And no democracy can survive 
a, a, a massive economy, you know, climate or um, or economic shock, at least in fragile states. Uh, so many countries may see democratic collapse, and it's not because of ideology; it's because of pure economic collapse and climate shocks that are not being alleviated by the G20 or the major countries, because the major countries are fighting each other instead of helping the others. Um, that leads me to global governance on the brink. Uh, we just had uh, a very high stakes in Bali around the G20. And miraculously, Bali worked for now. Indonesia appeared to have saved the world. <laughs> and I can say a lot more about this because I follow G20 very closely. Uh, and now the ball is in India's court, but this is this remains extremely fragile. Uh, it worked in the sense that the 20 managed to have a common statement, including condemnation of the war in, in Ukraine, even though Russia is on the G20. So that was quite of a miracle. I'll leave details on that for uh, the Q&A, but something major happened. And by the way, it happened because it was not in the West. The West would not have succeeded in sharing a G20 right now. Only Indonesia, India, countries like this, major global SaaS countries now have the ability to do this, uh, which says a lot about the state of the world. Um, more for Q&A if you're interested. Um, now, how do we make sense of the tensions in the Indo-Pacific and the tensions with China? And here we can bring three theoretical lenses. One is a Chinese crisis. Uh, the second one is a great power transition. So it's an IR story, realism. And the third is an even higher level, a mismatch between global integration and the human mind focused on domestic narratives. So it's just to present three options, there's more options we could take. So for China, clearly the Chinese internal model is in crisis. Um, what Pitt and Potter at UBC has called the, the developmental bargain, um, you know, really that emerged in the Deng era um, on top of the Maoist states and party structure, which remain under, uh, was one where citizens gain social and economic freedom, as well as wealth and technology and travel freedom, if they accepted CCP dictatorship. Uh, this model surprisingly delivered 40 years of extraordinary growth. In fact, this is the biggest amount of growth anywhere in human history. Um, and it created China into a systemic power with a huge middle class, about 300 million strong. However, after 2008, you know, I take 2008 following Susan Shirk on this, the new book, Overreach. Uh, others point 2012 with Xi Jinping, but really it started in 2008. Uh, a combination of fear and hubris um, it, we, within the CCP. Uh, now embodied by Xi Jinping, has led to a different pathway where uh, corruption and inequality became greatly feared by the leadership. They thought that they could lose power because of that, coupled with the feeling that there were greater social freedoms that would soon come back to bite them, has led to a rupture. The CCP had to choose between either liberalization and further institutionalization, maybe a pathway down a semi-democracy or some elements of liberalization, or crack down to reaffirm the CCP's control. And it shows the latter. Uh, under Xi, national security has expanded institutionally and massively. Um, so that's one tr change of trajectory. Internationally, China has followed the stakeholder model that is the, to be a stakeholder in the global system. And in fact, I'll show uh, some comparative data, but under Trump, the US did more to disrupt the global governance system than China uh, because they kept uh, you know, a stakeholder role in many institutions. But gradually they fear, they have come to fear that the US would never allow uh, China to rise. Uh, they also felt in 2008 that there was an opening uh, because the US was weak with the financial crisis. So they became more and more assertive. Uh, so that's where there's a combination of the hubris along with the fear. Um, and then we get to 2022, where the CCP made life hard for the middle class. And for the first time, the middle class became angry at the CCP, uh, which make it more risky, more dangerous for the CCP. Uh, so that's one story. A, a second story would be 
the domestic system doesn't matter very much. Whatever is changing incrementally within China is not critical. What's critical is the relationship among the great powers. And so according to hegemonic realism, if you have a hegemonic transition, that is you go from one dominant power to a decline in that power and a rising power, no matter what the domestic systems, you will have tensions and you will have a security dilemma, you will have an arms race, and the declining power will try to throw the kitchen sink at the rising power and accuse it of everything. And the rising power will feel always threatened and insecure and will try to find all kinds of ways to go around the booby traps and the minefields laid down by the right, by the dominant power. That's classic realism. And according to Allison, there are ways to mitigate that. You need global institutions, global norms, people to people and cultural engagement, domestic support on both sides, and support by middle powers and third parties. And today, in the last three years, we see an erosion of all this. And so we have an unbridled competition among the declining hegemon and the rising power. Uh, and so you could explain this without talking about Xi Jinping. Uh, and in some ways, this explanation should be the first one. It explains 60, 70% of what's happening. Uh, and then some other things can only be explained by looking inside China. Uh, but this is important to keep that. And I'll show you some numbers. Uh, this is nominal exchange rate. So it's actual economic and military power. Um, the OECD, the, that is the advanced democracies of the world, went from being 82% of the world GDP to 60% in 2021. That's minus 22%. The US went from 31 to 24, Japan 15 to 5, EU 27 to 18, the G7 from 75 to 49. And why it matters is because the OECD refused to open the governance of IMF, World Bank, etc. They control 65% of the votes because they had an overwhelming majority of the GDP. But if the G7, for example, is now at 49%, it's harder for the G7 to tell the world what to do. Uh, so it matters fundamentally. The developing world, meanwhile, went from 18 to 40%. That's huge. In PPP term, 55%, so it's a majority. China went from 4 to 19. India, 1.4 to 3.3. Uh, Russia... Russia flat because in uh, in, 19, in 2000, they were very low, but in 1990, they were at 2%. So they mostly uh, stayed flat from 1990 to 2021. ASEAN doubled, that's Southeast Asia. Brazil has been flat. But many parts of the world are rising. This is the rise of global south. Um, and in comparative racial terms, China versus US was only 6% in 1990, 12% in 2000. In 2010, reached 40%. In 2021, 77%. And in general, two-third is a critical ratio. You can see in history that when a rising power reaches two-third of a hegemon or dominant power, all hell breaks loose. The rising power starts to uh, throw all kinds of stuff at the rising power. And there's a risk of war, right? That's the two cities trap. Uh, the last time it happened was Japan. Japan reached... Um, actually, Japan versus U.S. in 2000, in 1995, you don't have it here, but in 1995, it reached 65%. And in the 80s, when Japan was rising, the U.S. saw Japan as a total threat and threw everything at Japan. Uh, and then since then, Japan has fallen back. Um, so China versus Japan, what's dramatic is in 2010, they reached 100%. In 2000. China was a quarter of Japan, and now China is four times Japan. Those are huge disruptions, huge, huge disruptions. They go faster than the human psychology can go. So human psychology cannot keep up with those things. And it, it creates all kinds of psychological, uh, you know, misunderstanding, misperceptions. And it threatens the system, of course, as well. Um, Accompanying this is the export dependence. So countries like Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Australia, Indonesia have become massively dependent on China uh, for their exports. Uh, so even Japan is 27%, you know, Taiwan is 45%, Australia 43%. Uh, and that's, a, you know, accompanying the rise of, of China as a major economy. 
But by the way, that means that if Korea or Japan or Taiwan are forced to decouple from China by the US, they will have recession, a huge recession. The economy would blow up and then the governments would fall because the public cannot accept it. So it's, it's one thing to have the US tell its allies decouple. Uh, the reality doesn't work, right? Because the size of China is too big. Um, that's the, just before pandemic, those are the Asian air corridors or Asian networks. You could see they're centered on China. Uh, this is major innovation hubs. You find some in Taiwan, Japan, and Korea, but a lot in China. And this is all integrated. So Asia became more and more integrated around China. Uh, that leads us to the question, what is China doing <coughs> with respect to global governance? And I've been working on tracking in every global institution and all this. This is, of course, focused on economy and environment. Uh, but what I observe is China before pandemic and before the trade war with Trump was actually all over the map. There was not a single story. China was not, uh, you know, a systemic disruptor across the board. Uh, in some place, places, it was a status quo supporter and was proactive. In the G20 in general, China was very status quo supportive. Same with the SDGs, with climate after 2015, always trade until 2017. In some areas, it's proactive and challenging the status quo by inventing new institutions. And in some cases, it's reactive, either as a balancer that is working with US and with EU and Japan and others against the US, um, or being a dis systemic disruptor, uh, cyber, energy, on close, et cetera. So it was very interesting to see how China was all over the map in that rising phase, 2008, 2018, before the US and China got into an acute spiral uh, beginning 2018. Um, in terms of economic and environmental crisis, uh, the position on global institutions until 2020, you find that on G20 reforms in general, China was lined up with Japan and EU, and the US was blocking a lot of things. On WTO, it was the US that disrupted the WTO the most, right? Uh, Paris Agreement, it was the US that pulled out while China was supportive. On the Nagoya Protocol and Biodiversity, same story. In GMO regulation, same story. Chemical Convention, same story. SDG, same story. So it's, it's a more complex story than just what we read in Washington. However, when it came to security and political dimensions of the liberal international order, while China supports the UN system or UN peacekeeping, uh, they don't support the International Criminal Court, along with the US. Um, they don't support R2P, along with the US. And they block democracy promotion, uh, human rights at the global level, including Xinjiang, the, anything around security, US-led alliance or East Asia security. So it puts China in a weird box, right? They supported a whole bunch of pillars of the global order, but they oppose other pillars, the security political pillars. Um, and the third narrative on what's going on, so we have a mismatch between global integration and domestic political institutions and narratives. And that's the paradox of globalization or global integration. Uh, globalization has generated great wealth, including among, uh, you know, with linkages between China and the West, but it's under institutionalized and power remains in nation states. And nation states are organized around myth, narratives, historical experience, common emotions that are not understood by outsiders and amplified by social media. So we are today in a period of clash between national, cultural, political emotions and the reality of global connectivity and global economic integration. We now want to follow those more ancient nationalistic narratives pretty much everywhere but we don't yet realize that if we follow those all the way and refuse to cooperate in global institutions, we will destroy the global economy the way it was destroyed in the 1930s. And it will uh, bring down you know, economies and societies in a tailspin, right? So we, are not, we, are, we don't fully understand the world that we face. And we as citizens are kind of separated. We have separated the different parts of us. Um, the implications in the, is that the global interdependent world is vulnerable and nationally driven myths and ideas can rise and lead to ruptures. 
And then in turn, that lead to tit for tat interactions with other who interpret the actions taken by another country through their own national narratives as targeting them. We use simple heuristics of us versus them to simplify and exaggerate the actions taken by another, and that leads to cascade effects, which in turn are accelerated by inequalities and social tensions. Uh, that story has a lot to do with what happened uh, between China and the US. Um, and I want to point here at a book, Why We Fight, that just came out, and it's a very interesting book. It's very useful for the Ukraine war, by the way. But he says war, war and fighting actually rare for humans because the costs are so great. But there are five factors, unchecked interests, intangible incentives like dominance, vengeance, or status, uncertainty when we misjudge, misjudge the bluff of others, commitment problems when there is a shift in power and political bargains are not credible, and misperceptions, which leads to overconfidence, demonizing opponents, and mistaken beliefs. Um, so I'm going to finish with this. When you have this environment and the amount of complexity and this very belligerent, indeed, uh, behavior by China, it leads to a diversity of responses. Uh, and those responses are predicated as much by what China is doing as national narratives in each setting and the other global uncertainties and global changes that are happening. It's all a mix, right? The U.S. response is we must reaffirm U.S. dominance and, and use power to stop the rise of China, indeed bring down China to a percentage relative to U.S. power that is more amenable to U.S. dominance. And China, the U.S. is ready to do this currently through its actions, even if the global institutions and the rules-based order are collateral damage to the approach. So it's a power-first approach. The risk is that it's easy for the U.S. to win early battles. Essentially, for 10 years, the U.S. can win every battle. They can indeed smash the technological rise of China. Uh, they, can, they have military dominance still. Uh, the problem is that by taking a power-only approach, that can, you know, that can work for 10 years, but that will not work after 10 years. And then what world will we have then 10 years later? That's why the EU, Japan, in general, Canada, would prefer less of a power-based approach, but the preference to use global rules and institutions to constrain China and continue an institutionalization pathway over a rule is might pathway. Uh, and that's the lessons from World War I, that's the lessons from Wilsonism, that's the what lesson from, you know, in the, in the 1928 kellogg Bryan Pact, or the whole EU story is based on that story, that a might is right approach doesn't work over time and lead to war and destruction of the world potentially. Um, and so we have actually different uh, preferences, uh, but, the power is still in the hand of the U.S. first. The democracy versus authoritarian focused, also pushed by the U.S., has essentially backfired because it's not accepted by India, including top Indian thinkers and policymakers, and it's not accepted by ASEAN. And a democracy approach against authoritarians cannot work without having India and ASEAN on board. Um, India is also not excited by IPEF, by the way, and I can keep that for the question. The Indian response on this and has been very blunt, has been, look, don't take a normative approach because you have been hypocrites and you have broken rules so many times before that you don't have credibility to take a normative approach. Uh, and we are now in a post-colonial non-Western world. So let's now work together, but on the basis of national interests. That's what India is telling the West, right? Which complicates the matter. Uh, Japan, Korea, Singapore have another issue. They would be destroyed if there is a war. You know, if there is a Taiwan crisis, uh, it will, Ch China will probably lose the war, but the war will destroy Taiwan, will destroy Okinawa, well, probably bomb Korea as well, and Singapore may be destroyed in terms of economy. Uh, and so their preference is, is to not have a war in Taiwan, right? So they need deterrence and they need uh, govern global governance and cooperation. So their preference is a triptych that include deterrence and some US alliance, including supply chain. Uh, B is global rules and institutions at all costs. So the preference ordering is different from the US. 
and C, cooperation and engagement with China to stabilize the situation. Um, my view um, is that we are probably one step away from a Cuban missile type of crisis. Uh, and the question is, will we have a Khrushchev and a Kennedy that know how to handle it? But currently, the misunderstandings and misperceptions between China and the West are so great uh, that you know, the risks are very high. And I'm on my way to Taiwan on Friday, by the way. Uh, some empirical cases, I'll leave it for further discussion. If you want to deepen any of this, the trade war, the COVID crisis, the Ukraine war, digital tech and green tech, and the Taiwan issue. There's a lot to say on each of those, but I'll leave them. Um, and I also have uh, 15 other slides if you want to hear about zero COVID in China and what happened. But for now, I'll conclude with this. What to do? in the age of disruption, including those tensions caused by China and caused by the US, um, you know, the age of disruption. My reactions are number one, be pragmatic. Ideology will fail us because ideology doesn't give us blueprints that are realistic and that allow us to avoid war and to, um, and to manage a very difficult moment. Second, we need imagination and go beyond existing responses that are too easy, but don't work. Third, we need diversification, decentralization, and anti-fragile responses. Fourth, we need new institutions and platforms. We need to innovate. We cannot just follow you know, with awe and fear uh, whatever Trump has been saying for years, right? For example, that doesn't work. Uh, we, five, we need to invest in community and social networks. And six, we need new types of leadership at multiple levels. Uh, but we do need, yes, we do need, you know, as Canadians, for example, resilience and protection, deterrence. You know, we probably need more military uh, capacity in Canada. It's too weak. But at the same time, we need to invest in system-wide resilience through communication and coexistent principles and the ability to understand the other side. And today, you know, the U.S., for example, but even in Canada, we discourage that. We're running away from that. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I try to stimulate uh, the great minds that you are <laughs> um, uh, to uh, a great discussion. I look to learn. Look forward to learning from you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Eve. That was a tremendous talk. You've given us so much to think about. Um, if people would like to ask questions, I'd uh, I would encourage you to unmute yourself and ask them, or you can type them up in chat. Who would like to start off? Judah? Well, I, I wanted to go right back to the very beginning and um, ask about climate change. On top of all of that is climate change. So, where, I mean, it's going to happen. It's already happening. It's going to be incredible to the economy. Where would you put that in? So, yeah, so climate... To me, that's the number one crisis, right? Uh, along with the crisis of human nature and psychology, we have to, that's what you know, Harari and others are saying, uh, or Kahneman and, and others, they're saying, we cannot get out of this age of disruption without having some investment in, in human psychology and managing our human nature better. But, um, but climate um, is accelerating. So there's bad and good news. The bad news is, is currently accelerating very fast, exponentially much faster than we expected. We have seen the heat dome, we have seen you know, atmospheric rivers here, and many countries are gonna experience failure. They start to be great anger. The president of Nigeria wrote an op-ed uh, in the fall in the Washington Post saying, 34 out of 36 provinces of Nigeria are underwater. It has never happened in history. This is not normal. And Africa historically has caused 1% of global emission. Uh, the West has caused 60% of global emission historically, uh, 65 almost. Uh, therefore, the West has flooded us. You're going to have to pay for this. There has to be reparation. Uh, you know, he wrote this like this in an op-ed. And I can tell you that young people from Africa and other countries are very animated by those thoughts. The Pakistanis said it too. There's going to be have to be reparations. Um, so that is very, very intense. That's the bad news. The good news is there is exponential acceleration of the green tech transformation. Uh, and it's accelerating because it's become a national security issue. 
So the U.S. refused to do anything for 20 years, and now it's doing it in the name of national security with the IRA. The IRA has $400 billion of subsidies for climate stuff. And we see an explosion of investment uh, in solar and all kind of stuff. Uh, and we find it across the board. So we are now mm -hmm. catching up. We are like 20 years too late in investing, really. But it's happening. But it's going to happen in a very competitive way. Maybe it's the only way humans mm -hmm. act. Uh, so we have the bad and the good news uh, at the same time in a bundle. Uh, in the short term, though, we, we're going to need collectively G20 and others to really put more money in the mitigation fund and to go help people like Pakistan and Nigeria when they hit a major crisis. And so far, there's no democratic support in places like Canada or the US. Right? We're not ready to put billions of dollars in funds to mitigate what's happening. Uh, but that's going to have to happen soon as well, right? Uh, and for the young people that I interact with, this is number one. You know, I'm struck. I give them 20 systemic things. China is usually number 20 or 19. Uh, and they want action on climate. And many of our students here say they won't get married and won't have kids because of climate. Uh, so, yeah, but in Washington, it doesn't surface very high. Uh, it's way behind, you know, the Cold War with China. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you, Yves. Um, Olaf, uh, you had your hand up. I did have my hand up, but it really was undercut by Judy's question. But let me just uh, expand a little bit on that because I'm, I'm a member of a group of the Maritime who are investigating the climate and nature emergency, uh, Eve, and, uh, and uh, I do thank you for, for your presentation. It's brilliant. And the perspective is something that really most of us have lost out on. I'm still in the globalization uh, field and re realize that I'm way out of date in that. <laughs> My comment is this, that, that in a sense, the only connectivities that exist are those in the ecological world. And that it's not surprising that the young people are interested in this. Uh, it, it is a desperate concern. I have grandchildren who are totally exercised about it. And I'm sure everybody else has a similar experience. And in, in, in many ways, the, the only direction in which I think we can move is that of repenting. The old prophetic vision of getting a new frame of mind. And uh, how to do that is, is an extraordinary difficult problem. But I wonder if you have some comments on this because I know you, you, you take economic connectivity very seriously, and so do I. But how importantly should we reckon with the connectivity of, of nature? Yeah, so the, I, Olaf, I've always uh, admired your work and it's great that you're here. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Um, um, I completely agree with you. Uh, the ecological connectivity is the dominant one for humans, ultimately. The economic one was created, the ecological is a given. We are on one planet. Uh, the climate is common, the oceans are common, the future of the planet are common, is common. Um, and so it's, a, it's an absolute reality that nobody can escape. Uh, and so the, this concept that only sovereignty matters and this and that is not real, right? We are in this Gaia planet, it's all interconnected. Um, the, so there is again bad news and good news. I mean, the, the bad news is we have been too slow. I mean, a lot of people have been writing about this for a long time, I mean, decades and decades. And Gaia, you know, the famous book goes back <laughs> decades. And um, but uh, we, you know, the, the ideas did not change uh, the awareness of majority of citizens in democracies and elsewhere uh, until it's now. I think it's beginning to happen. Um, and that's the good news. There, it's catching up, right? For the young people, I think it's a majority view. Um, and so we still have other generations to convince. But, uh, but um, now the next issue is how to bring this up at the top, top level. And because that awareness, if it can be brought everywhere, would then mitigate uh, the thing that 
interestingly, you know, human nature, we have this bundle of thinking our human nature. We start, I'm fascinating recently reading more and more neuroscience and psychology and epigenetic. Thanks to Judy is pushing me on that. Uh, and, you know, there, there is a big part of our intrinsic behavior or what's deeper in our brain, Judy knows better, but not the neo, uh, neofrontal cortex, what's deeper tends to bring the this intuitive fight or flight response or tribal response when we see something that looks dangerous from some people we don't know we're very ready to fight that seems to come first before the holistic thinking about a common planet and so that's what we struggle with right is how to tone down uh the other part and especially in places like washington or beijing and instead accentuate the sense that you know that common planet's future should really be number one that's i think we need new pathways new avenues and it has to somehow transcend uh but in democracies it has to reach the majority now we don't have a majority we get that yet because people are the majority is still ingrained in an in a socio-economic system where you know getting a job and paying bills and this and that and comes first some for some reason and driving to work before uh other things um and yeah and and i guess by the way i would fold that i know there's some philosophers here people in political thought i fold for that and i'm curious what phil will say to that i fold uh major mistakes made in the western enlightenment and industrial revolution phases the major mistake which is a departure from what most other civilizations have written over millennia and what indigenous people still believe today which is that humans and ecosystems are interconnected deeply interconnected and that also you know other indigenous people or many uh civilization around the world have always known that body mind and feelings are all interconnected uh we somehow in the west have disconnected those things and we have treated health you know as something physical separated and we have disconnected humans from the natural environment we're only beginning to reconnect and it's all written in indigenous writings or in chinese writing or indian writings and all this but we have to quickly catch up and come back to uh you know Locke, in a sense is a criminal uh what Locke wrote about you know taking over land that are underused and destroying them you know uh was criminal and, and is the foundation for where we are today the problem is Locke is also foundation of liberalism and we love liberalism uh so we have to backtrack in some deep wrong uh decisions that were made in uh in the in the western thinking here to overcome the situation <laughs> I'm curious what Phil will say um excellent thank you so much <laughs> Sorry, Bill, you're on um, mute. Mm -hmm. So can I just ask you, I mean, I do not wish to put you on the spot about going to Taiwan, but I'm overwhelmed with people wanting to travel like crazy yes, now. I can hear you. I know. Is overwhelmed, you mean yes, people well, should not travel? Mm -hmm. there, there's huge advertisements. Everybody's looking for a trip to take. Um, you know, the idea that travel is a major contributor to climate change just hasn't sunk into, um, maybe it's just because they want to get back to making money, but I mean, I think I'm not going to travel anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, something I, I reflect a lot about uh, in consciousness, uh, and I think the answer has to be uh, not absolute, that is, uh, you know, for example, we still need Blinken to go to China because yeah. otherwise we may have war, right? And, and uh, you know, so you know, diplomacy doesn't work by Zoom. So you still, you have a bunch of conditions that where you do need travel. And in fact, you won't solve climate without travel and people talking with each other. So in that sense, cannot be absolute, but we should work to really check very systematically any any travel and to avoid the mass travel to cheap, uh, you know, like one week packages that I think should be gone. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can cut, but you have to keep diplomatic. And, and for universities, I still think students will not be 
citizens that can deal with what I'm describing here if they at least don't have a chance to have a global experience in another setting uh, because they won't get this by Zoom. So there's certain travel that we still have to keep. And meanwhile, we have to work very hard on the acceleration of green tech. And you know, in 30 years, they will be green planes. Now, uh, air travel is, it used to be 2%, maybe now it's 3 or 4% of global CO2 emission. So it's not, you know, it's not 90% or it's not even 10%, right? So, but like everything, I don't think there's an absolute response, right? We're going to have to find, uh, but I guess for those of us who end up traveling for diplomatic meeting or for teaching or for having global, we have to scrutinize any travel. So for example, for me, what I try to do is go for a longer trip and bundle everything possible and then cut anything that's uh, an, a very short and that's anything that would be more holiday. So holiday, I'm happy to walk on my island <laughs> where I am, uh, and, and et cetera. And then there's family. So for migrants, you have the issue of family uh, when you have parents who are very old and whatever. So those travels, very hard to cut. But unless we cut all migration, <laughs> anyway, it's complicated. <laughs> Diana, you had your hand up for a while. Mm -hmm. Unmute yourself, Diana. Mm -hmm. First of all, Eve, that was an absolutely wonderful tour d'horizon of the situation we're in at the moment. And also, I have to say, quite a gloomy one. Uh, but one of the one issue that I'd like to deal with you a bit, you use the word hegemony in talking about uh, relations between the powers. But if you look inside China, which is really all I'm capable of doing, you see a man who has Xi Jinping, who was trying to make himself into the very traditional Chinese ruler, the hegemon. Uh, hegemons have actually never lasted very long in Chinese history. They tend to um, be playing on their own against very strong odds. And I think we've got a lot of signs now that Xi Jinping is much less powerful than he pretends to be. First of all, he lost a huge battle after two years of zero COVID. He had to cave in and has created, as far as one can tell, a fair degree of chaos. Every single person I know in, in China so far has got COVID as a result of loosening it up. Huge numbers of people have died. We don't know the figures, of course, uh, but a very substantial number. And he was seen to have to step down in the most humiliating way imaginable. Secondly, he may have packed the leadership with toadies, and he certainly did after the party congress. But amazingly, in, uh, in the Central Committee, he has not a single person from Guangdong, Canton, the, the south, uh, southernmost part of China, most important economically of all. It would be like having some Canadian system where Ontario isn't represented at all. And that has to be a huge sign of weakness that he's got no support in this vast area that he can call on anyhow. And thirdly, I think particularly for our audience, it's important to note, he's not a young man. He's younger than some of us, but uh, considerably older than Eve. And he is now on his own because the retirement age has been imposed for everybody except him. So his subordinates are getting younger and younger. He's getting older and older. He's still dyeing his hair. Many of his subordinates are not. I've noticed a large number of, el of older Chinese who are now praying, appearing with a little gray or silver hair, but he is not. The doctors amongst us might be able to tell us whether he's a healthy man or not, but to me, he looks uh, not healthy at all. He's always straining at his suits. They're having to be let out on a regular basis and the buttons still don't do up properly. So here he is basically on his own with a few toadies trying to run an enormous country. The people most likely to get fed up with him are the military and that's very dangerous. It has been dangerous again and again in Chinese history. But we have to remember China is also full of extremely talented, worldly people, many of them partly foreign educated now, who really 
could do with a better leader than this. We don't see the political struggles in China as we do in, in Washington, but they are there. And the tougher Xi Jinping appears to be, the weaker he may actually be. So I'm hoping, as you can probably tell, that um, he won't be with us forever. And that brings its own dangers, but also some real benefits. Thank you, Diana. Do you have uh, some comments, uh, Heath? Yeah, thank you, Diana. Those great comments. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful. Uh, and I, I can corroborate. I, I think I agree with everything you said. Can corroborate uh, on Xi Jinping the rumors. You know, I I talked to a lot of Chinese, some that are here, but they all connected through each other to all their friends and alumni, etc. Um, and I, so I'm part of all this. And what you hear about Xi Jinping, number one is most people say he's actually not very smart. You know, he's a lot less smart than others like Liu He and whatever. Yes. Uh, and in fact, he didn't attend university to get his graduate degree. <laughs> <laughs> he, he like he was a paper degree as far as we understand um and so that's number one and he doesn't get the economy he's not someone who understands the economy um it's really someone who understands power and and he has shown that uh the second thing is that the middle class uh was giving him the benefit of doubt for years because the anti-corruption campaign was very popular the economy was still growing they were traveling and then they liked the idea of China dream and all this. All this was okay. You know, you never heard deep doubts. There, there was a sense of nationalism, you know, that was orchestrated, but it, they believed in it. But uh, 2021, by the way, I, I treat it very differently from 2022. Because in a way, in 2021, the zero COVID worked and was sort of similarly followed by, say, New Zealand, Taiwan, uh, even Korea. They were not that different until the end of Delta, until the fall 2021. But in 2022, Omicron changed everything. Uh, and Omicron cannot be stopped by those measures. Uh, and so the others in East Asia understood it. And they opened. And all of them suffered, by the way. You know, Tsai Ing-wen in Taiwan just lost the local election quite badly because the public's not happy that you have, uh, you know, you have almost... You have 550 deaths per million when you had zero before Omicron. And so that's a few you know, thousand dead in Taiwan that the people is not happy about. Uh, Korea is at 650. You know, everyone under Omicron had to open and they all suffered all over the region. Uh, the best performer is Singapore at 300 deaths per million, followed by Japan at 450. But it, it's they were all below 50 before Omicron, right? But then Xi Jinping doubled down. He had a, a, a committee uh, with smart people, you know, uh, doctors and very smart policy people like Shui Lan, now he's the head of Schwarzman College at Tsinghua, uh, an advisory uh, health committee. They recommended opening up in March 2022, gradually over three months. And he overruled it for pure political reason. And the draft has been leaked uh, last Last months and I have it. So we knew what the plan was and how he was overruled for political reason by Zhang Xie uh, and uh, essentially Xi Jinping. But um, they um, and um, and he did it because he wanted to, you know, he was stubborn. He didn't understand really what Omicron was. So that means nobody had the ability to explain to him. He didn't listen. Uh, and then he, uh, he thought that, you know, it's very much like greatly forward. He thought like Mao that his decision, his authoritarian decision can defeat Omicron. Uh, and you can't defeat reality at some point, right? So, and the middle class saw this. Initially, they kind of went with it. They got very angry, you know, beginning in April with Shanghai. And then they got very angry in the summer. And even more angry in uh, in November, we had the biggest protest. But when I've, I've talked now to dozens of people, including all the network of alumni of Tsinghua University, the top university, and they all said, they all, the 100%, the both based in China and outside, they said the, the, the zero COVID and the end of it demonstrate complete policy failure and complete uh, uh, inability to govern by Xi Jinping. And that's new. So yes, he controls the system, but the middle class knows that he has failed in a massive way, and that's new. Uh, now, we don't know the pathway beyond that, right? Because it's not easy. <laughs> There's so many tools of control, and 
what the pathway will be is complicated and it could be a rupture or it could be gradual, but it's a big difference in early 2023 that the middle class knows that the king is naked and that's the first time. Uh, um, so that's that's all I can say, but it, it, it means it's a vulnerable and what he will do, we don't know. I think what he's trying to do now is to regain uh, some support by reopening the economy, at least making sure oh, that the economy... I warn them that it'll be one more, two more only. Uh, yeah. But... I hear voices. But uh, anyway, he's trying to get out of the predicament, but he's in a predicament. Uh, and by the way, the balloon story and other things like India, the war with India, do show that, like Diana said, that there's real issues of control of the military. Uh, most likely the balloon is a bureaucratic program that was months in preparation that's really managed by the military. Uh, but, you know, it did disrupt the Blinken visit. And so uh, all the Doklam battles in India in 2017 clearly were not authorized by the top. And it led to three of the top six military people uh, to be uh, pushed out in September 2017. We see a lot of oddities in the management of the military. So either it's going to let them splurge and do crazy things, or it doesn't really control them. But there is there is a lot of space there that we don't fully understand. Oh, by the way, there's one person older than Xi Jinping, and he's the head of the military with 72. <laughs> <laughs> The head of the right the commission uh yeah. that was also the other exception that he let happen mm -hmm. okay well thank you uh, diana for that and uh and eves now i have a question from philip resney Eve, i'm not sure it's a question you sort of taunted me <laughs> <laughs> so i i felt that need to at least step up to the plate to this degree look i agree with you that if we're really going to start looking at the deeper roots and god knows there are many uh, they're not only the psychological they are indeed partly the philosophical and the, and the political and you're not wrong to say that the enlightenment is a is a good place to begin because there is a certain hubris which has come out of you know which is part of the western you know history of the last two three centuries and one understands quite well why significant parts of the global south aren't exactly seeing us as the model and that there are these great demands that are being placed in terms of resources in terms of yeah the kind of uh, capital and resources that would, that would be required to even begin to face the climate issue but i wanted to shift it a little bit to uh, looking at the sort of at the, the political grounds of what's been going on here and i can't help but feel that the equivalent of the Enlightenment dream was, a, was I suppose, I don't want to blame poor Fukuyama for too much, but the, the delusion or illusion that many of us had in the West that after the end of the Cold War, the whole world was going to become liberal democratic. And we've discovered to our horror, but also I think unfortunately to our, uh, you know, to some degree uh, with a certain realism that that's not so. And we know, and need not mention Putin or Xi, and there are you know many many examples throughout the world. And even in so-called democracies, we're seeing characters like Modi, who are not exactly acting as a model liberal democrat either. So we we know that this is much less uh, obvious than before, and that raises a question, and it's a, you know it's a much deeper question, and it, you know, it goes back. We can, we can go back to to precedence in this, that significant sections, perhaps even of, of, of not only of societies, but of um, maybe a part of, of well, I would almost going to say significant sections of humans or human nature, seems to be rather content with autocratic or, or non-democratic forms of rule. And we're certainly seeing that. Uh, for example, the degree of support, we know the propaganda that's very powerfully at work, the degree of support that is there actually for Putin in the current war that's going on in Ukraine within Russia itself is, is you know, it, it's not to be underestimated, though the more liberal elements, of course, of Russian opinion are, are, not, bu are not buying into it. China, again, uh, another very powerful force. Of all the ideologies that we've left behind us, one that has not been left behind us is nationalism. And in, in, in some significant ways, it's as powerful as ever. And of course, it can take many forms, but they can take, it can take these very, very negative types of forms. So just to go back to your, your point about the Enlightenment, it's, there is a certain hubris, which certainly has characterized the Western attitude towards the world. And one of, we're gonna to have to recognize that this is indeed a much more complicated polycentric world. And that there's a tragic dimension which sadly runs into our interactions with each other. And we're gonna to have to try very, very hard. And it's not just from our part, 
to see if we can, in fact, find a common strand, which, which climate is certainly one of the key ones, there's no doubt about that, which can actually overcome some of these divisions as opposed to the 101 things which I'm afraid can continue to divide us. So I share your pessimism and I, I, I go back even earlier than enlightenment, I go back to the Greeks who I thought had a pretty good sense of the tragic in human nature, but I think we're seeing a significant amount of good work at the moment. So that's my response to your goading. Thank, thanks, thanks, Brilliant. Dora. I can add 10 seconds on that. Actually, I'm not that pessimistic. No. That is, I do see lots of positive change. Uh, you know, I, when there are certain platforms like the Paris Peace Forum or the Berlin Global Solutions Summit or the Jeju Forum in Korea that bring a lot of people together. And in general, they all get it. And we, you can have people from many, many countries, of many different walks of life, you know, academic and civil society and others, and, and you see at large level, people will start to get the prognostic and to know how to invent new forms of cooperation. So that we, we kind of know what to do. And I'm writing about this, the entrepreneurship that we can have in cooperation and new form. The problem, in, and the most worrying thing for me in the short term is actually the US uh, because the US has 50% of the world military. And if you have a Trump, uh, or Pompeo or someone like that, they can actually trigger World War III, right? They <laughs> and so, um, and U.S. democracy will go through real bumps for the next years. And they have the power of starting the war or not, right? Uh, and so the whole world depends on them, basically. And if you have extremely emotional, uh, not qualified, not analytical people like Trump in charge or Pompeo and others, it, it, there is risk, right? That's where the risk is, the pessimism. Um, of course, I'm pessimistic about Xi as well, like Diana would say, but the power is less. That is, they, as far as we know, Xi is not Putin, he's not as deluded in his psychology and as extremely unstable. You know, essentially, Putin is a psychological case, right? Uh, it's, I don't know what the term is, but we have to ask a psychologist, but, uh, he, he made up a world in his mind and that Ukraine was this unfaithful part of Russia. That's so critical. Little Russia. It's little Russia. Yeah. yeah. Little Russia. And then nothing else matters. And he said, we don't need the world if Russia cannot be happy in it. And being happy means having Ukraine, uh, then you don't need the world. So I mean, that's an extreme nutcase, right? <laughs> We, we don't see she that far. He's been a technocrat. He's been an apparatchik. chick. He likes power, but I, I hope, right? So, uh, so I don't see him yet able to just launch the war on his own and, and jumping into a Taiwan war, knowing that he will be destroyed in the process. But, but the U.S. could. You, know, you could have an elected Trump or, or some of the extreme Republicans in power and landing in Taiwan uh, you know, a new break pipe and starting the war that way, or bring aircraft carriers to Taiwan, triggering the red lines. And so I, I see, I'm more worried there. But beyond that, everyone else, I see a lot of change and evolution in so many people. Uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of South Asians, Indonesians, a lot of people get it. And there's a sense, let's bring a new awareness. Let's create cooperation together. The West will have to accept not to call the shots. And to, uh, and to really co-create with non-Western players. The, most of the West gets it. It's only Washington that not, is not ready for that. <laughs> so I'm optimistic and pessimistic. <laughs> thank, thank you, Eves. I got, um, we're just about out of time, but I'd like to get to a couple of questions in chat, if I could. And if you wouldn't mind sort of answering quickly in about 90 seconds, yeah. I'd appreciate that. No, no problem. Everything. I can stay longer. I, it's amazing. Everything is Everything has been so uh, wonderful so far, all the all the discussions we've had. Okay, uh, I think, well, this one you've probably answered. How strong is China's support for Russia? Um, maybe it's very you... weak. It's weak. Uh, and I have evidence. The evidence that's not known is confidential, but I heard it from the G20 Shepherd of Japan because I went to debrief the top uh, maker in Japan in December. And actually, it astonished everyone. But at the G20, when there was in Bali, there was a whole fight around the wording on the war in Ukraine, right? And the West wanted a very strong condemnation and Russia was blocking. To everybody's surprise, China stayed silent and did not defend Russia a single time. 
they want it out of the debate entirely. And they left Russia hanging out on its own. Uh, and so that's that's a piece of evidence uh, that was very, very interesting. And I, I'm hearing this from a hawkish Japanese who hates China. So that's but more credible in that sense. Um, what they have not sent military, military weapons uh, and they have bought oil, but less than India. <laughs> uh, however, there is one reality is for them there. They feel they are under mortal threat from the U.S. They think the U.S. wants to destroy them and they want to cut their economy and cut their technology. And they feel that if Russia is defeated, then the U.S. will turn all its might on China. So there is this, you know, this fear. Fear factor leads people to do stuff. So because of that, they don't want Russia to be defeated. But they also think Russia did some terrible mistake and, uh, and, and cheated. They're angry as far as we know, because they cheated China. They made them sign that declaration in early February uh, without informing them of what was coming. And then uh, essentially, Russia has unleashed chaos on China because now everybody is afraid of China in Taiwan. Everybody was sending weapons to Taiwan. It's all because of Putin. It's not what China wanted, right? Uh, and it, it's led to an acceleration of containment of China. Uh, and so what you hear is they're very, very frustrated. Uh, but there is that security dilemma where they fear the U.S. more, more than anything else, right? Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. And one more here. Um, you talk about the uh, uh, needing reparations uh, for West uh, for the da the threatened countries and climate change, but and reparations for by the Western countries. But you also talk about um, um, Canada's weak military, and we should spend more on the military. So, how do you reconcile those uh, those things? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Um, we're not talking huge percentage, right? Well, the military is going to be unavoidable. Canada will have to go like the other Western countries to 2% of GDP. Now we're 1.3, right? But that's 0 0.7. That's true. And the climate, you don't even need that much, right? When we talk of billions of dollars, uh, you know, what we need is a quick fund, uh, the so-called loss and damage fund that was agreed at the COP27. Uh, the EU stuck at its neck out first, uh, unsupported by US, Canada, and Japan, by the way. Uh, but uh, we're talking of putting, you know, uh, on, separately from the Green Fund, but say if there was 10 billion a year collectively, and that's very doable, really doable, because that would allow for quick interventions during the, the catastrophes in the short term. Uh, but you have to compare it to the alternative. The alternative will be, millions of refugees, millions, especially in Europe, can this far, but uh, in Europe, we, we, they're afraid of, you know, 500,000 now. In 10 years, it's going to be 5 million. And in 30 years, it's going to be 20 million uh, from climate. Um, and, um, and so the cost of not acting now in prevention and in uh, remedy and supporting those countries is so much greater then uh, what are they going to do? Are they going to put all kind of lines of ships in the Mediterranean and shoot them? I mean, uh, you know, the the they, you have to compare alternatives and then uh, find the ways, right? Uh, including private funding and whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. And one one final one here. Uh, what is the potential role of the UN? Um, big role to play because it's seen as legitimate for everybody except to some extent the U.S. and Israel. There's like three, four countries where the U.N. doesn't have 50% support. One is the U.S., one in Israel. Uh, but almost every other country supports the U.N. at the tune of 60%-ish, right? So it's seen as legitimate. It embodies a lot of hopes and dreams. Uh, the, the Declaration on Human Rights is accepted by everyone, including China. Uh, on some campuses, you do see it enshrined in stone. Um, because it's a starting point for conversation. Um, and so the UN has to be critical. The, the problem of the UN, there's two problems. The first one is the US. The US has always had the problem with the UN because they don't fully control it. And because they have preeminent power as a hegemon or quasi or declining hegemon, still dominant power. Whenever the UN stands in their way, they want to blow up the UN or not fund the UN. Uh, and that's, there's always that temptation and it's always an issue. And then the second is the UN was a compromise with five veto powers 
and they veto each other. And so when the five agree on anything, things work very nicely, but when they don't, they veto each other. Uh, but below that, there's a lot of good stuff going on. There's a lot of good people work at the UN. And among our students, you will see it. Majority love the UN. And I see this everywhere, even in China. Uh, young people love the UN. So there, it, it has potential. We just have to keep working and working through it. Mm. Good. Well, thank you, Eva. I think we'll have to draw the questioning to a close here. I certainly could, many questions I'd like to ask. Could you stay on for another couple of hours and you and I could have a dialogue? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think it's been absolutely delightful to have you today. We've been very privileged to hear your thoughts and uh, your discussions of things. Thank you so much for talking to us and uh, um, keeping so many people so interested. And, thank you. Uh, many thanks. And I, I think we have a final slide to show, uh, Sarah, if you wouldn't mind putting it up. Uh, thank you. Uh, about the upcoming events, the uh, travel group on February the 16th, the community volunteer group, 23rd, photo group on the 24th. And the next general meeting will be March the 22nd at 2 p.m., uh, given by Ben Schneiderman, my uncle, the legendary photographer. David Seymour Chim, 1911 to 1956. So that concludes our meeting. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for attending, and uh, goodbye.